My name is Stephen Keith. I live up by Concord, New Hampshire. And this is the mess kit and area for the 26th Yankee Division reenacting group. All of this stuff that you see here came down in the back of that truck along with towing the water buffalo, which is 250 gallons of water. And what we have here is my wife, Jeannie, and she's about to demonstrate how you use the immersion heaters in the, the area for cleaning your mess kits. That's a standard mess kit that has the spoon, the fork, the knife, the plate. The only thing that it's missing is the uh, coffee cup, but we can do without that for now. What you do is you dunk it in the barrel full of hot water. You use a scrub brush and you brush it and you get all of the uh, food and material off of it, coffee, gravy, what, what have you. And after you've done that, being very careful not to burn yourself because the water is it's either boiling or just about to boil. And after you do that, you come over here and this one has soapy water in it. Usually it, it's a rolling boil. You can see it's got some bubbles to it when you stir it up. And you do that one and then you come over here to the last one. This you dunk that in here a few times. So you have a pre-rinse, the soapy clean, and then the uh, final rinse. And then you just dry the, uh, the utensils out, and then you fold it back up into the mess kit, which is just as big as the uh, plate there. Now, is this set up a typical field kitchen that was in use during the Second World War? Yes, we have a couple of modifications. If you come over here, I will show you uh, what, what we've done and what we have. here is we have a couple of different stoves. This is a squad stove. This one is made with the same drip system. Normally you have a, at the other end of this hosier, that's what that tripod is for, you have a jerry can hung upside down. And the gasoline drips in here and you have a little burner and it splatters and same thing. It goes around all the burners on all of the uh, cook area here and then it goes up the stack. Next door we have the standard World War II field rangers and they um, still use these today, although today they run on uh, diesel fuel. Originally these ran on gasoline, like a Coleman stove or a Coleman lantern that has a mantle. Um, they're, they're very tricky to use and they can be kind of dangerous. So all of these right now are just using propane space heaters. We're making some more coffee right there. GI coffee. You boil the water with uh, coffee grounds in it. You put a couple of uh, eggshells in it. And when the eggshells sink, they usually take the coffee grounds with them. And so you have just the coffee up on top, and you have to ladle it out. Sometimes you have to filter it a little bit um, so you don't have too much chewy coffee of, of a pan. We have, uh, let me show you, we have some of the pans here. This is a pan, typical pan. And like, for example, yesterday, what we did was he made beans and franks. And we put the beans and the franks in here, and we cooked them. Well, heated them up anyways. And uh, you can either put this up on top. You see we have these little levers that flip out from the side to keep the thing from falling down through. You can either put it in there or you can open the door and put it in here. Okay. And you can use it with or without the lid. I can't put that on without the things up. And you can actually put a couple of them in there in a couple of different locations. And you can move, it, it can be used as an oven. And what they did, you see, they had the, the brackets here. And one of the things they had for these was they had a, a plate that was actually two pieces of steel with insulation in between. And the idea was that it would give them more uniform heat so they could cook bread. You have these little door things here. Keep shut, and that one I want to open. Get this one. No, one of these open. So you can open that up, and you can help control the temperature that way. And you can also look in to see what's going on without having to open this. You also have a set down here normally that close when you're running with the gasoline burners. Um, but again, they're, they're very finicky, and uh, they can be extremely dangerous. My uncle was a cook in World War II, and he had a truck like mine. And he had three of these down the side. And he said every now and then one of them would go nuts on him. 
and he had a special steel hook with a loop on the end and he just hooked the burner and drag it down the back and throw it off the back of the truck to get rid of it before it burned the truck up. They have handles on the side. This is how you pick them up, one on each side. Or, um, typically you empty them before you um, try to pick them up. They also have locks here, spring-loaded locks. They actually hitch together. Okay. So if the, you have them in the back of a truck, like my truck there, um, you can just strap one of them down and the other ones will stay together because they're all hitched. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and over here, this is the 250 gallon aluminum water buffalo that would carry your drinking water and uh, water for cooking and cleaning and assorted other things. It has a hand pump on the front and a hose that comes out and it's got a strainer there on the front which is buried underneath all this stuff. And what they would do is they would come up to a stream or something and they'd throw that in there and they'd hand pump it to fill it up. And then they'd throw um, some, a lot of times, iodine in them. I think that's mm -hmm. what they used pretty much in World War II. Mm -hmm. We use Clorox, although mm -hmm. this thing is not too fond of Clorox being aluminum. Um, and typically, this one, these are very difficult to find the faucets for. So this is just a generic faucet. But originally, they had three faucets across there, two small ones and a large one. And they had squeezy handles on them. And uh, so you just squeeze them and the water comes out and you let them go, there's no twisting. And they had covers for them such that um, as you're driving down the street, if it's dusty or something, it doesn't get all inside the valves and, and spouts and stuff. And this has a little net on it, the, the loop there that goes on the back of the truck and that's how it gets towed. Mm -hmm. um, naturally, it's got cable for um, the lights in the back. And as I said before, we had all of this stuff in the back of that truck. It was quite a, quite a job to put it all in there, and I took pictures of how I did it because we have so many pans. We brought extra pans with us. We had to put them in here in non-standard ways to make them all fit. And then over here, what we did was we brought a couple of barrels, 55-gallon barrels, like they would typically use you know, to set up a table. But that's how we do our serving. Mm -hmm. And we, we take and we can serve right out of the lids there that's why we have these pieces of uh, two by six, because you have the handle sticking down, otherwise it's, it rocks all over the place. They, the book says that each one of these is capable of feeding 30 people. So We could tep typically feed 90 people, but it's more efficient to have them divided up this way and have them cook different things yeah. you know, simultaneously, otherwise it gets a little difficult to try and um, mm -hmm. you know, feed the people simultaneously. In addition, uh, I showed you the pot that's in there that we're making the, the coffee in. There's uh, three different pots that come in there, and they're three different sizes. Uh -huh. And we left the biggest one at home because we didn't need it. This is a Maramite can, which is a later version uh -huh. in World War II. And these have, they could bring food out to the troops in these, either hot or cold, they're insulated. And they have a cover, and uh, oh, this way, it works better, like that. Okay, and typically what they would do is sometimes with, if they were close to the front, they'd have the field kitchen set up and they'd put the hot food in here, throw it in a Jeep and take it out to the uh, troops out in the field. So they wouldn't have to have the field kitchen too close to the actual front. Um, these work very well. They're very popular today uh, for people, you know, in, that are doing this or, you know, people in general that buy them, you know, for camping and things like that. Uh, they had a mess section associated with the... Um, I'm not sure if, what size group they had. Um, like I said, I have the squad um, stove there, which would you know, typically be a smaller person. This is a smaller group. Um, this is more um, for a larger group. And you know, it was typically, you know, if things were going well, you'd probably move like maybe once a day or every other day, depending upon how far they advanced. If, you, if it was more of a static sort of thing, you'd be hanging back a little bit and they would use the Maramite cans to bring the troops forward because if it was more static, it might mean that you might have to go backwards a little bit. And it takes a while to pack all of this up and you wouldn't want to be overrun with, uh, with enemy troops and, and lose your uh, hot food. I would say probably out, out of artillery range um, so that you wouldn't, because you're going to have you're going to have smoke sometimes, and, and you're going to, you know, that would draw enemy fire because they would know that if you had smoke, either you had a, a campfire or you had uh, immersion heaters and, and things like that. And that would make the troops typically unhappy if they didn't have any more hot food and they had to use the, the rations, K rations and the C rations. If you look at the manuals that they have in World War II for cooking, they had stoves that were made to be buried half in the ground that you could burn, burn wood in. 
uh, and they had uh, um, you know a whole bunch of field expediences, mm -hmm. you know, for helping to make uh, um, food for the troops, you know, and and we had so much stuff, you know, especially as the war progressed, that you know, yeah, if the stove melted, you know, you know, making food for the troops, you can always get another one, you know. They would have beans a lot of times, and they would have. Uh, uh, Franks and any any sort of uh, local meat that they could get. If the cook was good, he was very popular. Uh, my uncle, I'm half Italian. My uncle's full Italian, uh, the one that was the cook. And uh, I guess the troops loved him because he would go and he would get local vegetables and and uh, poultry and things like that. And he would his troops ate better than uh, most of the troops. So they had you know they were pretty self sufficient when they were out in the field. Even if they if they had local stuff that they could get. Mm -hmm they could be completely self-sufficient as long as they had the gasoline to cook it with.